Welcome back to SuperCloud 2. This is Dave Vellante and we're here exploring the intersection of data and analytics and the future of cloud. And in this segment, we're going to look at the evolution of cloud and try to test some of the super cloud concepts and assumptions with Brian Gracely. He's the founder and co-host along with Aaron Delp of the popular Cloudcast program. Amazing series if you're not already familiar with it. The Cloudcast, one of the best ways to keep up with so many things going on in our industry, enterprise tech, platform engineering, business models, obviously cloud, developer trends, <laughs> crypto, web 3.0, sorry, <laughs> Brian, I know that's a sore spot, but Brian, that's thanks okay. for coming on the program, really appreciate it. Yeah, yeah great to be with you, Dave. Happy New Year and uh, you know, great to be back with everybody uh, with, uh, with SiliconANGLE again this year. Yeah, we, we, we love having you on. Uh, we miss working with you day to day, but I want to start with Gracely's theorem, which basically says, I'm a paraphrase, <laughs> that for the most part, nothing new gets introduced in the enterprise tech business. Patterns repeat themselves, maybe get applied in new ways. And, and you know this industry well, when something comes out that's new, if you take virtualization, for example, been around forever with mainframes, but right. then VMware applied it to you know, solve a real problem in the you know, client service system. So, and then it's like, okay, this is awesome. We get really excited. And then after a while, we push the architecture, we break things, introduce new things to fix the things that are broken and start adding new features. And oftentimes you do that through acquisition. So, you know, has the cloud become that sort of thing and is super cloud sort of same wine, new bottle following Gracely's theorem? Um, I, I, yeah, I think there's some, of, I think there's some of both of it. I, I hate to, I hate to be the sort of, it depends sort of answer, but I, I think to a certain extent, you know, obviously cloud in and of itself was, was kind of revolutionary in that, you know, it wasn't that you couldn't rent things in the past. It was just being able to do it at scale, being able to do it with, with such amazing self-service and then, you know, kind of proliferation of like, look at how many services I can get from, from one cloud, whether it was Amazon or, or Azure or Google. Um, and then, you know, we, we slip back into the things that, that we know. We go, oh, well, uh, okay, now I can get computing on demand, but, but now it's just computing or I can get database on demand and it's, you know, it's got some of the same limitations of, of say, a, of database, right? It's still, you know, I have to think about IOPS and I have to think about uh, caching and, and other stuff. So I, I think we do go through that. And then we, you know, we have these sort of next, paradigms that come along. So, uh, you know, serverless was, was another one of those where it was like, okay, uh, it, it seems sort of new. I don't have to, again, it was another level of like, I don't have to think about anything. And I was able to do that because, uh, you know, there was, there was either, you know, greater bandwidth available to me or, or compute got cheaper. Um, and what's been interesting is, is not the sort of, you know, that specific thing, you know, serverless in and of itself is just another way of doing compute, but the fact that it, it now gets applied as, as sort of a no ops model to, you know, again, like how do I provision a database? How do I think about, you know, do I have to think about the location of a service? Does that just get taken care of for me? So I, I think the the super cloud concept, and I, I, I did a thing and, and you and I have talked about it, you know, behind the scenes that maybe the maybe a better name is super app um, for something like Snowflake or other, but I, I think we're we're seeing these these sort of evolutions over and over again of what were the big bottlenecks? Um, how do we how do we solve those bottlenecks? And I think the the big thing here is it's it's never it's it's very rarely that you can take the old paradigm of of, of what what the thing was the concept was and apply it to the new model. So I, I'll just give you an example. So you know something like VMware, uh, which we all know, we, you know wildly popular, wildly used. Um, but when we apply like a, a super cloud concept to VMware. The, the concept of VMware has always been around a, a cluster, right? It's, it's some finite number of, of servers. You sort of manage it as a cluster. And, and when you apply that to the cloud and you say, okay, there's, you know, for example, VMware in the cloud, it's still the same concept of, of a cluster of VMware. But yet when you look at some of these other services that, that would fit more into the you know, super cloud kind of paradigm, whether it's a, a Snowflake or a uh, MongoDB Atlas, or you know, maybe what Cloudflare is doing at the edge, those things get rid of some of those old paradigms. And I think that's where stuff, you start to go, oh, okay, this is very different than, than before. Yes, it's still computing or storage or, or data access, but there's a, there's a whole nother level of, of something that, that we didn't carry forward from the previous days. Um, and, and that really kind of breaks the paradigm. And, and so that's, that's the way I think I've, I've started to think about, are these things really brand new, um, yes and no. But I, I think it's when you can see that big, that that thing that you didn't leave behind isn't there anymore, um, you start to get some, some really interesting new innovation come out of it. 
Yeah, and that's why, you know, lift and shift is okay. But when you talk to practitioners, they'll say, right. well, you know, it really didn't change my operating model. And so yeah, I just kind no. of moved it into the cloud. Yeah, there were a couple, some benefits, but it was maybe one zero, not three zeros that I was looking for. You know, we always right. talk about what's great about cloud and the agility and, and all the other wonderful stuff that we know. What's not working in cloud, you know, tie it into multi-cloud, you know, in terms of, you know, you hear people talk about multi-cloud by accident. Okay, and that's true. Um, yep. What's <clears throat> not great about cloud? And then I want to get into, you know, is multi-cloud really a problem or is it just sort of vendor hype? But, but what's not yeah. working in cloud? I mean, you mentioned serverless and serverless is kind of narrow, right? For a lot of stateless apps, right. but, but, but right. what's not great about cloud? Well, I, I think there's a few things that if you ask most people, they don't love about cloud. I, I think, uh, we, you know, we can argue whether or not sort of this, this consolidation around a, a few cloud providers has been a good thing or a bad thing. I think regardless of that, you know, we're, we are seeing, we are hearing more and more people that say, look, you know, the experience I used to have with cloud when I went to, for example, an Amazon and there was a, you know, a dozen services, it was easy to figure out what was going on. It was easy to figure out what my billing looked like. You know, now they've, they've become so widespread, the number of services they have, uh, you know, the number of stories you just hear of people who went, oh, I, I started a service uh, over in US West and I can't find it anymore because it's on a different screen and I you know I just got billed for it. Like, so I, I think the sprawl of, of some of the clouds has gotten, has created a, a user experience that a lot of people are frustrated with. Um, I think that's one thing. And we, you know, we, we see people like DigitalOcean and we see others who are saying, hey, we're going to be that simplified version. So there's, there's always that yin and yang. Um, I think people are, are super frustrated at, at network costs, right? So, you know, and that's, that's kind of at, at a lot of at the center of, of maybe why we do or don't see more of these super cloud services is just, you know, in the data center as an application owner, I didn't have to think about, well, where, where does this go to? Where are my users? Yes, somebody took care of it, but when those things become front and center, that's super frustrating. That's the one area that we've seen absolutely no uh, cost savings, cost reduction. Uh, so I think that frustrates people a lot. Um, and then I, I think the third piece is just, um, you know, we're, we, we saw, we went from super centralized IT organizations, which, you know, for, for decades was how it worked. It was part of the reason why the cloud expanded and, and became a thing, right? Sort of shadow IT and I can't get things done. Um, and, and then now what we've seen is sort of this proliferation of, of little pockets of groups that are that are your your IT for for lack of a better thing, whether they're called platform engineering or SRE or DevOps, but we have this plurif, pl, pl, you know expansion explosion, if you will, of groups that if I'm an app dev team, I go, hey, you help me make this stuff run, but then the team next to you has another group and they have another group, and so you you see this explosion of you know we don't have any standards in the company anymore, um, and and so sort of self service has has created its own nightmare uh, to a certain extent for a lot of larger companies. Yeah, thank you for that. So, you know, I want to, I want to explore this multi-cloud, you know, by accident thing, and is it a yep. real problem? You hear that a lot from vendors, and we've been talking about super cloud as this unifying layer across cloud. Yeah. You know, but when you talk to customers, a, a lot of them are saying, yes, we have multiple clouds in our organization, but my group, we have mono cloud. We know the security, yeah. you know, edicts. We know how to, you know, deal with the, the, the primitives, whether it's, you know, S3 or Azure Blob or whatever it is. And we're very comfortable with yeah. this. It's, that's how we're simplifying. So do you, do you think this is really a problem? Does it have merit that we need that unifying layer across clouds or is it just too early for that? Um, I, I think, yeah, I, I think what you, what you laid out is, is basically how the, how the world has played out. People have, have picked a cloud for for a specific application or a series of applications. Um, yeah, I think if you talk to most companies, they would tell you, uh, you know, holistically, yes, we're multi-cloud. Not maybe not necessarily on. I don't necessarily love the phrase where people say like, "Well, it happened by accident." I think it happened on purpose, but we we got to multi-cloud not in the way that maybe that vendors you know perceive you know kind of laid out a, a map for it. So it was it was well, you will you will lay out this sort of super cloud framework. Uh, we didn't call it that back then. We just called it sort of multi-cloud. Maybe it was Kubernetes or maybe it was whatever. Um, and, and different groups, because central IT kind of got disbanded or got you know, fragmented, it turned into go pick the best cloud for your application, for what you need to do for the business. 
And then, you know, multiple years later, it was like, oh, hold on, I've got 20% in Google and 50% in AWS, and I've got 30% in Azure. And, um, you know, it's, it, it, yeah, it's been evolution. I don't know that it's, I don't know that it's a mistake. I think it's, it's now groups trying to figure out, like, should I make sense of it? You know, should I try and standardize and I backwards standardize some of the stuff? I think that's going to be a hard thing for, uh, for companies to do because I think they, they feel okay with where the applications are. They just happen to be in multiple clouds. I want to run something by you, and, and you guys, yeah. you and Aaron, have talked about this. The, you know, still depending on who, which keynote you listen to, small percentage of the workloads are, are actually in cloud. And when you were with us yeah. at Wikibon, uh, I think we called it true private cloud. And we looked at things like Nutanix, and there were a lot of other examples of yeah. companies that were trying to replicate the hyperscale experience on-prem. Yeah. And, and we would evaluate that, you know, beyond virtualization. And, and so we sort of defined that, and, and, but, but I think what's, Maybe what's more interesting than super cloud or cross clouds is if you include that, that on-prem estate, because that's where most of the work is being done. That's where a lot of the proprietary right. tools have been built, a lot of data, a lot of software. So maybe there's this concept of sending that true private cloud to true hybrid cloud. So I actually think hybrid cloud in some cases is the more interesting use case for so-called super cloud. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I, I, I think, I think there's a couple aspects to it. I think, you know, if, if we were to go back five or six years, even maybe even a little further and, and look at like what, what a data center looked like, even if it was just, hey, we're a data center that runs primarily on VMware, we use some of their automation versus what you can, even what you can do in your data center today, the, you know, the, the gains that people have seen through new types of automation, through Kubernetes, through GitOps and, and a number of these things, like they've gotten significantly further along in terms of I can provision stuff really well, I can do multi-tenancy, I can do self-service. Um, is it, you know, is it still hard? Yeah, because those things are hard to do, but there's there's been significant progress there. I don't, you know, I, I still look for kind of that that killer application, that sort of, uh, you know, lighthouse use case of, of hybrid applications, you know, between data center and between cloud. I think, you know, we see some stuff where you know, backup is, is a part of it. So you use the cloud for storage. Um, maybe you use the cloud for certain kinds of resiliency, uh, especially on maybe front end load balancing and stuff. But I, I think, you know, I think what we get into is, is this being hung up on hybrid cloud or multi-cloud as a term and go like, look, what are you, what are you trying to measure? Are you trying to measure, you know, efficiency of, of, of IT usage? Are you trying to measure how quickly can I give these business, uh, you know, these application teams that are part of a line of business resources that they need. Um, I think if we start measuring them that way, we would look at, you know, you'd go, wow, that it used to be weeks and months. Now we, we got rid of these, uh, these boards that have to review everything. Every time I want to do a change management type of thing, we've seen a lot more self-service. I, I think those are the things we want to measure on. And then to your point of, you know, where does, where do these super cloud applications fit in? I think there are a bunch of, of instances where you go, look, I would, I, I have a, you know, global application. I have a thing that has to span multiple multiple regions. That's where the super cloud concept really comes into play. Um, we, we used to do it in the data center, right? We'd had all sorts of technologies to help with that. I think yeah. you can now start to do it in the cloud. You know, one of the other things trying to understand, I'd love to get your thoughts on this. Do you think that you, know, you, you again have talked about this, like I, I'm with you, it's like, how is it that Google's losing, you know, $3 billion a year or whatever? I mean, because when yeah. you go back and look at, at, a, at Amazon, when they were at that level of revenue, where Google is today, right. they were making money, you know, and, right. and they, they were actually growing faster, by the way. So it's kind of interesting what's happening with Google. But, but, but the reason I bring that up is, trying to understand if you think the hyperscalers will ever be motivated to create standards across clouds, and that may be a play for Google. I mean, obviously with Kubernetes, it was like a Hail Mary and kind of made them relevant. Um, where would Google be without Kubernetes, but then did it achieve right. the objectives? We could have that conversation some other time, but, but do you think the hyperscalers will actually say, okay, we're going to lean in and create these standards across clouds because customers would love that, I would think, uh, but it yeah. would, would sub-optimize their competitive advantage. What are your thoughts? I, I think, uh, I, you know, I, on the surface, I would say that they probably aren't. Um, I, I think if you, I think if you ask them the question, they would say, well, you know, first and foremost, um, you know, we we do deliver standards, so we we deliver a you know standard SQL interface or a SQL you know or a standard Kubernetes API or whatever. So 
So in that, from that perspective, you know, we're not locking you into, you know, an Amazon specific database or a Google specific database. You, you can argue about that, but, and I think to a certain extent, like they've, they've been very good about, Hey, we're going to adopt the standards that people want. A lot of times the open source standards, I, I think the, the problem is let's, let's say they, they did come up with a standard for it. I think you still have the problem of the costs of migration and the, you know, the longer you've, I think their bet is basically the longer you've been in some cloud. Um, and again, the more data you sort of compile there, the, the data gravity concept, there's just going to be a natural thing that says, okay, the, the hurdle to get over to say, look, we want to move this to another cloud um, becomes so cost prohibitive that they don't really have to worry about, you know, oh, I'm going to get into a war of, of standards and so forth. I think they sort of realize like that's the, that's the flywheel that, that the cloud creates. Uh, and, and, you know, unless they want to get into a, a world where they just cut bandwidth costs, like it just kind of won't happen. Um, you know, we, I think we've, we've even seen, and, and, you know, the one example I'll use, and I forget the name of it uh, off the top of my head, but there's a, there's a Google service. I think it's, it's like BigQuery external or something along those lines that, that allows you to say, look, you can use BigQuery um, against like S3 buckets and against other stuff. And so I, I think the cloud providers have kind of figured out, I'm never going to get the application out of that other guy's cloud or the other, you know, the other cloud, but I'm, maybe I'm going to have to figure out some interesting ways to sort of work with it. Um, and, you know, it's a little bit, it's a little janky, but that might be, you know, a, a moderate step that, that gets sort of gets customers where they want to be. Yeah, or, you know, be interesting if, if you ever see uh, AWS, for example, running its database in, in other clouds, uh, you, you started, yeah. even Oracle is doing that with, with, with Azure, which is a form of, of super cloud. My last question for you is, I want to get yeah. you thinking about sort of how the future plays out. You know, if you think about some of the companies that we've put forth as super cloud, and by the way, this has been a criticism of the concept. Charles Fitzgerald, everything is super cloud, which if true would defeat the purpose, of course. And, and so right. with the community effort, we really tried to put some guardrails down on the essential characteristics, the deployment models, you know. So for example, running across multiple clouds with the purpose build pass, creating a common experience, metadata intelligence that solves a specific problem. I mean, the example I often use is Snowflake's governed data sharing, but you got Snowflake, Databricks, Cloudflare, Cohesity, you know, I just mentioned Oracle and Azure, these and others, they certainly claim to have that common experience across clouds. But my question is, again, I come back to, do customers need this capability? You know, is mono cloud the way to solve that problem? What's your, what are your thoughts on how this plays out in the, in the future? of, I guess, PaaS, apps, and cloud? Yeah, um, I, I think a couple of things. So, so from, a, from a technology perspective, I think you know, the companies you named, the services you named have sort of proven that, that the concept is viable and it's viable at, at a reasonable size, right? These aren't completely niche businesses, right? They're, they're multi-billion dollar businesses. So I, I think there's, there's a subset of applications that you know, maybe a, a bigger than a niche set of applications that are going to use these types of things. Um, a lot of what you talked about is, is very data centric and that's, that's fine. That's, that layer is, is, is figuring that out. Uh, I think we'll see messaging types of services. So like Derek Collison, uh, Derek Collison's Sendaya company runs a, a sort of a super cloud for messaging applications. So I think there'll be places where it makes a ton of sense. Um, I, I think the, the thing that I, I'm, I'm not sure about, and because again, we've been now 10 plus years of sort of super low, uh, you know, low, in, uh, not low interest rates uh, in terms of being able to do things is a lot of these things come out of research that have been done previously, then they get turned into maybe somewhat of an open source project and then they can become something. Um, it, you know, will we see as much investment into the next snowflake if, you know, the, the interest rates are three or four times they used to be, do we, do we see VCs doing it? So that's the part that worries me a little bit is I think we, we've seen what's possible. I think, um, you know, we, we've seen companies like what those services are. I think I, I read yesterday, uh, Snowflake was saying like their biggest customers are growing at 30, like 50 or 60%, like the, the, like the, the value they get out of it is becoming exponential. Um, and it's just a matter of like, will the economics allow the next big thing to happen? Because some of these things are, are pretty, pretty cost, you know, uh, expensive to get started. So um, I'm bullish on the idea. I don't know that it becomes, I think it's okay that it's still sort of, you know, niche plus plus in terms of the size of it, because, you know, if we think about all of IT, it's still, you know, even microservices is a small part of, you know, bigger things. Um, but I'm, I'm still really bullish on the idea. I, I like that it's been proven. Um, I'm, I'm a little wary, like a lot of people, the economics of, you know, what might slow things down a little bit, but 
um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I, I think the future is going to involve super cloud somewhere, um, whatever people end up calling it. And you, you and I discuss right. that. Um, but I don't, I don't think it goes away. I don't think it's a, I don't think it's a fad. I think it is something that, that, um, people see tremendous value in. it's just, it's gotta be, you know, for what you, what you're trying to do, your application specific thing. You're making a great point on the funding of innovation and we're entering a new era of public policy as well. r and tax credit is now shifting to, yeah. you know, you're going to have to capitalize that over five years now. And, and that's something that goes back to the 1950s. And many people would argue that's a, at least in part what has helped the United States be so, you know, competitive in, in tech. But Brian, yeah. always great to talk to you. Thanks so much for participating in the program. Great to see you. Thanks, Dave, appreciate it. Uh, good luck with the rest of the show. Thank you. All right, this is Dave Vellante for John Furrier and the entire CUBE community. Stay tuned for more content from SuperCloud 2.